Hello friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. As always, I greatly appreciate you. So this video is going to be a little different than our usual topics, but as you know, sometimes I take a step back from true crime to focus on other topics I find interesting that I think you might too. So we're taking it back all the way to our childhoods, and more specifically, fairy tales. As many of you may or may not know, many of our beloved fairy tales have very real origins, from people to events, and I want to talk about five of these tales and their true beginnings. The way I'll set this video up is first I'll give you a synopsis of the most popular retelling of the fairy tale, then I'll explain how the story came to be. I also want to go ahead and note that this video isn't completely free of true crime because some of these stories do have gruesome origins. So if that's your usual content and what you like to watch on the channel, stick around, it's coming. But as always, I ask you to please sit back, relax, and let's dive in. The Pied Piper of Hamelin Set in the town of Hamelin, Lower Saxony, Germany, in the year 1284. Hamelin at the time is faced with a horrible rat infestation and begged for anyone to take care of their issue. A piper dressed in a coat of many bright colors appeared in the town and claimed to be a rat catcher. The piper promised to get rid of the rats in return for payment, and the townspeople agreed. The piper took out a small pipe from his pocket and began to play music. Every rat from every house gathered around the piper, and he led them away from the town to the river Wesser, where he walked in and the animals all followed him. The rats fell in and drowned. Now that the problem was solved, the piper returned for his payment. Although the townspeople were happy to be free of their plague, they regretted their promise of compensation, and they refused to hold up their end of the bargain. Angry with the people of Hamelin, the piper left but vowed revenge upon them. He returned on June 26, 1284, the day of St. John's and St. Paul's during the early hours of the morning. No longer did he don his colorful outfit, but a hunter's costume and red hat accompanied by a dreadful expression. He played his pipe once again, except instead of rats, the children of Hamlin came to him. The piper led the children into a mountain where they all disappeared. He was never seen again. Depending upon the version of the story, two, sometimes three children were left behind due to ailments, with one being blind, so they were unable to see where the other children were going. Another, deaf, unable to hear the piper's song, and the last being injured and unable to keep up with the group. These children were there to tell the townspeople what happened to the other children that day. Although we've been told the Pied Piper is merely a fairy tale, there is evidence to show there may be some truth to the story. The earliest known record of this story comes from the town of Hamlin. The story of the piper was depicted in a stained glass window created for the church, which dates around 1300 AD. This picture was unfortunately destroyed in 1660, but several written accounts have survived throughout time. The oldest of these writings comes from the Lunenburg Manuscript circa 1140 to 1150, which stated, quote, In the year 1284, on the day of Saints John and Paul, on June 26, by a piper clothed in many colors, 130 children born in Hamlin were seduced and lost at the place of execution near Copayan." End quote. Another entry dated 1384 in Hamlin's town record stated, quote, It is 100 years since our children left. End quote. The children of Hamlin went missing in 1284, but how is unclear. Many theories have been discussed, such as the children actually dying from natural causes and the piper just being a personification of death. Another suggested theory was the children were victims of the plague and the rats equated to the Black Death. Other historians believe the children may have been sent away by parents due to extreme poverty, or the children were participants of a children's crusade being tied to Ostilung in which a number of Germans left home to colonize Eastern Europe. In this particular scenario, the piper would have played the role of a recruiter, being responsible for organizing the migration. These organizers often wore colorful garments and played music as a way of attracting settlers. 
Lastly, the theory of the Piper could have simply been a child abductor who stole children during the night. No one really knows what happened to the children of Hamlin, and there are so few details. Regardless, historical records suggest the story of the Pied Piper was a real event where 130 children disappeared, and the mystery of what happened to them may never be solved. The Tale of Bluebeard Bluebeard was a wealthy but hideous nobleman. His beard was so black that it appeared to be blue. He was married six times, all were beautiful women, but each one vanished mysteriously. He lived in a marvelous castle and with his latest wife disappearing, he asked his neighbor if he can marry one of his daughters. This daughter would be Bluebeard's youngest bride as of yet. The neighbor was hesitant at first, but after Bluebeard throws him a banquet, he wins the father's affections. The pair marry and wife number seven moves into Bluebeard's castle with him. Shortly after marriage, Bluebeard has to leave the castle for business and provides his new bride with a key to the castle. He explains this key opens any door and he didn't care what she did while he was away. Her only rule was to not go into the room at the end of the corridor unless she wanted to meet his wrath. The wife agrees and Bluebeard leaves with no intended return date. She invites her siblings to come stay with her in the castle while he's away. After a while, curiosity gets the better of her, and the wife unlocks the forbidden door. What she found was not what she was expecting. A gruesome scene. Bluebeard's previous wives' bodies were discovered. He was keeping them inside of the room. Horrified, she flees the room and doesn't think any more of it. However, she notices the key is now tainted mysteriously with fresh blood, and no matter how much she tries to clean it, the blood will not disappear. Bluebeard returns unexpectedly and finds the bloodied key. In a rage, he threatens to harm wife number seven, just as he did to the previous six. But unlike the previous wives, she stalls for time asking to pray before Bluebeard takes her life. Before she finishes her prayer, her siblings come to the rescue, ending Bluebeard's life before he can take hers. Wife number seven inherits his fortune and castle and lives happily ever after. Many historians believe the character of Bluebeard was inspired by serial killer Gilles de Ray. De Ray was born sometime in 1405. He was a knight and lord from Brittany, Anjou, and later a leader in the French army and companion in arms to Joan of Arc. He and his brother grew up under the tutelage of his maternal grandfather due to the death of both parents around 1415. As a young man, de Ray was described as hot-headed, which translated well on the battlefield, where he, by all accounts, was skilled and fearless. His grandfather married him off to Catherine of Brittany. In 1429, he was assigned by the Dauphin to watch over Joan of Arc in battle. The two fought together in major battles, including the lifting of the Siege of Orleans. Later the same year, he was appointed to Marshal of France, the highest military distinction. Around 1434 or 1435, de Ray withdrew from the military. His career wound down due to the death of Joan of Arc in 1431. De Ray wanted to spend more times at his estate, which was among the richest in western France with the death of his grandfather in November of 1432. He lived extravagantly the years following his military retirement. So much so, he spent his fortune recklessly, paying for unnecessary expenses, including a play which nearly bankrupted him. He sold family lands to continue to live his lifestyle, which sparked bitter fights with his remaining family. He also dabbled with the occult as a means to save his rapidly collapsing finances, hiring alchemists and sorcerers. During these years, de Ray became concerned with religion and his own salvation, so he decided to finance the construction of a chapel for his soul. He called it the Chapel of Holy Innocence and staffed it mostly with young choir boys, all hand-selected by him. Rumors started to circulate that children were going missing in the areas around de Ray's properties. In fact, many of these disappearances seemed to be connected to the activities of de Ray and his servants. Doré was arrested in September of 1440 on charges unrelated to the missing children. Doré had an incident with a priest. He tried to kidnap him after the two had a dispute. This dispute ended up in an investigation which brought to light a series of crimes against him, including the murder of more than 100 children. 
The investigation was headed by the Bishop of Nantes, where extensive witness testimony was uncovered to corroborate the accusations. Under the threats of torture, Doré confessed to the crimes and even described how he tortured dozens of children that were kidnapped by his servants over a period of nearly a decade. For his crimes, he was sentenced to death by simultaneous burning and hanging, carried out in Nantes on October 26, 1440. It was common for boys to be taken away from their parents to work as servants for nobles, so many of the victims' families were unaware of what really happened to their children. His accomplices claimed his first assaults occurred between spring 1432 to 1433. Neighboring village peasants stated children entered his castle for food and were never seen again. Transcripts from the trial included testimony of the parents and graphic descriptions of the murders. Many of the details were said to be so lurid they were struck from the record. The number of victims is unknown since most of the bodies were either burned or buried. But it is believed DeRay claimed anywhere between 100 to 200 victims with their ages ranging between 6 to 18 years old, with majority being boys. In recent years, many have purported that DeRay may have been a scapegoat for the true criminal, the Catholic Church or the French state, especially since the confession was extracted under the threat of torture. However, many historians have studied the available evidence from the trial and hold to the belief that DeRay was the only one who committed the murders. Snow White a queen is sitting by an open window during winter snowfall when she pricks her finger with a needle causing three drops of blood to drop on the freshly fallen snow. She says to herself, how I wish that I had a daughter that had skin as white as snow, lips as red as blood, and hair as black as ebony. Sometime later, she gives birth to a daughter whom she calls Snow White. The queen sadly dies shortly after giving birth. Many years later, her father marries again. Snow White's stepmother is beautiful but vain and practices witchcraft. The stepmother has a magic mirror which she asks every morning. Magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Usually she's pleased with the response because the mirror never lies. But when Snow White reaches seven years old, her fairness surpasses that of her stepmother. And when the queen asks the mirror, it stated Snow White instead of her. The queen is envious and she grows to hate Snow White with passing time. Eventually, her jealousy becomes too much, and she hires a huntsman to take Snow White into the forest to murder her. As proof the job was done, she asked him to bring her Snow White's heart, which she planned to consume to gain immortality. The huntsman leads Snow White into the forest, but after raising his dagger to her, he finds himself unable to complete the job. Snow White learned of her stepmother's plan and begged the huntsman for her life. She stated she would run away into the forest and would never come home if her life was spared. Reluctantly, he agrees and instead brings the queen the heart of an animal to hide the truth. Snow White wandered the forest for hours when she finds a tiny cottage belonging to seven dwarves. No one appears to be home, so she enters the cottage where she eats, drinks, and finds a bed to sleep in. Shortly after, the dwarves return home and notice the signs of someone being in their home. They search until they stumble upon the sleeping Snow White. She wakes up and explains to the dwarves her situation, so they make a deal. If Snow White will be their live-in housemaid, she can stay in their cottage. She agrees, and for years, she lives with the dwarves. She grows into a lovely, fair young maiden. The queen, who believes Snow White has been gone for a decade, decides to ask her mirror again, who the fairest of the land was. And to her surprise, it replies Snow White was, and she was hiding in the forest with the dwarves. The news angers the queen, and she decides to handle Snow White herself. The stepmother appears at the cottage disguised as an old peddler, and offers her a colorful, silky lace bodice as a present. The queen laced her up so tight that she faints. The dwarves return in time to revive her by loosening the laces. Next, the queen dresses as a comb seller and convinces Snow White to take a comb as a present. She strokes her hair with this poison comb. Snow White is overcome by poison, but once again revived by the dwarves who remove the comb. In a last ditch effort, the queen disguises herself as a farmer's wife and offers Snow White a poisoned apple. She is hesitant to accept, so the queen cuts it in half, eating the harmless half and giving Snow White the other. She eagerly bites the apple and immediately falls into a coma. 
the queen thought she finally triumphed. The dwarves were unable to revive Snow White this time. They believe she was dead, so they place her in a glass casket. The next day, a prince stumbles upon her during a hunting trip. After hearing the story from the dwarves, the prince offers to take Snow White to her proper resting place back at her father's castle. While being transported, one of the prince's servants trips, losing his balance. This incident dislodges the piece of apple from Snow White's throat, magically reviving her. The prince is overjoyed and declares his love for her, asking for her hand in marriage. And she accepts. The prince invites everyone in the land except her stepmother. The queen, again believing she was free of Snow White, asks her mirror if she is the fairest, but the mirror replies the bride of the prince is fairer than she. The queen decided to crash the wedding. Once she arrives, she is frozen with rage and fear, when she sees Snow White is his bride. She attempts to kill Snow White again, but the prince stops her. The queen is punished for attempted murder and is ordered to wear a pair of red-hot iron slippers and dance in them until she drops dead. Snow White and the prince marry and the two live happily ever after. The real-life inspiration for Snow White is believed to be a woman named Margaretha von Waldeck. Margaretha was a German countess born in 1533 and described as a beautiful woman. She was named after her mother who sadly died when she was four years old. Her father, Prince Philip IV, remarried to a woman named Katharina von Hatzfeld. Allegedly, Katharina was not very fond of her new stepchildren and sent many of them away to live with various relatives. When Margaretha turned 16, she too was sent off. She moved in with her uncle Johann in Brussels at Valkenburg Castle. Around Margaretha's home were many functioning copper mines most of which were operated with child labor. Many of these mines were actually owned by her brother. The conditions were horrible and hard labor often stunted the children's growth, so they never grew to full height. It is reported that the mine gases also grayed their hair prematurely. The workers also lived in small cottages that often housed up to 30 occupants at a time. During her time in her uncle's court, she caught the attention of three nobles, including Prince Philip II of Spain, who fell in love with her. However, the King of Spain did not approve of this union, expecting his son to marry for the gain of his kingdom. Allegedly, when Prince Philip II took interest in Margaretha, her fate was sealed. Some say assassins were hired to take care of her. Over time, Margaretha fell slowly into a serious illness, and at the age of 21, she died on March 21, 1554. After her death, it was believed she may have been poisoned. Her will and testament written by a shaky hand convinced historians her death was not of natural causes. Beauty and the Beast In the story of Beauty and the Beast, a ruined merchant has several daughters, one of which he named Beauty. One day the merchant gets word that a trading ship unexpectedly returned to the harbor, and in an attempt to recover some of his profits, he set out to the ship. He asked each of his daughters what they would like for him to bring back to them. All of his daughters, except Beauty, requested expensive gifts, while Beauty asked for a single rose. The merchant sets off for the trip, but it turns out to be futile, so he returns home. On his way back, he is caught in a storm, so he takes refuge in a nearby castle. Inside of the castle, he meets no one but finds food, fire, and a bed prepared for him. The merchant stays for the night. The next morning, he gets up and leaves the castle, but on his way out, sees roses in the garden, where he picks one. Suddenly, a beast appears from the castle, enraged the merchant took from him after all of his generosity. In exchange for his life, the merchant offers to bring him one of his daughters. The beast spares him. Upon returning home, the merchant gives Beauty the flower and asks her to return with him to hold up his end of the bargain. Reluctantly, she goes, fearful she will be eaten by the monster. Instead, she's given lavish chambers, good food, and constant entertainments. The downside to her arrangement is she never sees anyone except the beast at dinner. Every night, the beast asks for her hand in marriage, but she refuses. After several months, she admits that she's grown fond of the beast, but she misses her family. The beast allows her to visit her family, but warns her if she doesn't return, he will die from grief. Beauty arrives home and her sisters are jealous of her new lifestyle, so they decide to distract her so she misses her deadline, since they assume the beast planned to eat her. Beauty returns to the castle late and finds the beast dying of sadness. 
Seeing him like this, she realizes she loves the beast and begs him to marry her. Immediately, he is restored to a handsome prince, and the pair get married. Beauty's sisters are also punished for their part. They are condemned to be living statues outside of the castle, forever viewing their sister's better fortune. The story of a beautiful woman falling in love with a beast has been passed from generation to generation, but it actually came true at one point. The inspiration came from Petrus and Catherine Gonsalves. Petrus Gonsalves was born in 1537 with a condition called hypertrichosis, a condition in which hair grew all over his body and face. Hypertrichosis occurs from an abnormal eighth chromosome. Petrus looked like a werewolf-like creature and was treated like a freak of nature. Around this time, legend of wild men, which are similar to the Sasquatch lore of today, ran rampant. And when the boy was discovered in Spain, he was believed to be some sort of human-wild-man hybrid. King Henry II of France loved to collect oddities, especially of the human variety. In fact, owning odd humans at the time was a symbol of wealth. Petrus was only 10 when he was discovered and given as a gift to the king. The child was clearly feral and was abandoned for some time, likely spending his life being feared. The king put the boy in the dungeon so his physicians could observe him and his potential threat level. During his examination, the physician discovered this creature was no wild man offspring, but rather a scared and hairy child. The boy could barely speak but knew his name. He told the king his name was Pedro Gonzalez. However, the king did not feel this name was fit for nobility, so he called him Petrus Gonsalves. Knowing the boy had the ability to speak, the king decided to give Petrus a nobleman's education. Petrus learned to read and studied Latin. His tutors were very impressed with how quickly he learned the various subjects. Petrus was even allowed to attend the royal court. As he grew older, Petrus was one of the few men at court who were not married, which was uncommon for a gentleman of his caliber. When Henry II died in 1559 from a jousting accident, his widow, Catherine, took control of the throne and his assets. This included Petrus. Catherine decided it was time to arrange a marriage for him, eventually finding another woman named Catherine, who was the daughter of a servant in the castle. Although the queen's intentions were viewed as righteous in finding Petrus a life partner, it turned out there were ulterior motives. The queen was curious as to what Petrus's children would look like if he were to have them with a regular woman. Catherine didn't know about Petrus's condition. She hadn't met him before the arrangement, and since it was an order from the queen, she had no choice but to marry him. Reportedly, Catherine was fearful of Petrus in the beginning, but the two did go on to have seven children together. Out of all seven, four of the children were born with hypertrichosis. While there is no evidence to prove it as fact, many historians believe that Catherine and Petrus did grow to love each other based on the way they posed in portraits. The queen commissioned many portraits of the family, but only had the children who had hypertrichosis pose with their parents. She wanted to keep up the appearance that her experiment was successful, that she tamed the wild man and successfully had hybrid children. These portraits were sent to nobles as gifts since they were all fascinated with oddities. But for some, this wasn't enough. Since the family were her property, the queen sold their children to nobles who could pay the price. Thankfully, the children were treated well in their new homes and received high quality educations and lavish lives. After many years, Petrus and Catherine were allowed to retire under the care of a duke in Italy. Documents show they tried their best to enjoy their life and what freedom they had left. Petrus saw grandchildren despite their family being torn apart years before. Catherine's death was recorded, but there is no official document for Petrus's death. This may be due to him not being allowed a Christian burial because many viewed him as an animal and animals did not receive the same sacraments as humans. Hansel and Gretel The story begins with a great famine sweeping across the country and a woodcutter is having a hard time feeding his starving family. The woodcutter has two children, Hansel and Gretel, from his late wife, but he has since remarried. The wife suggests to her husband they should take his children to the woods for them to fend for themselves, and so they have two less mouths to feed. After some hesitation, he agrees to her plan, but unbeknownst to them, the children overheard it and hatched their own plan. 
In the morning when the father gets the family ready to chop wood, Hansel gathers stones to mark their way home. After they separate from the children, the woodcutter and his wife think they're successful and return back to their home. But the children return shortly after they do. So the next day, the woodcutter tries again. The woodcutter doesn't allow Hansel to gather stones, so instead Hansel decides to use breadcrumbs as path markers. The woodcutter loses his children again, and the children start to make the trek back to their house. However, the birds in the woods ate Hansel's breadcrumbs, and the children are lost. They wander the woods for hours before stumbling upon a house made of sweets. The children who are hungry from their journey start taking bites of the house, when the owner, an old woman, steps out and invites the children inside for food. The children agree, but after entering, she traps Hansel and Gretel, revealing she is actually a witch and plans to eat them. The children are far too skinny for her, so the witch decided to fatten them up, starting with Hansel, and she decides to use Gretel as a servant in the meantime. Hansel is kept in a cage where the witch checks his weight by pinching his finger since she has poor eyesight. Instead of his actual finger, Hansel gives her a chicken bone in order to postpone his death. Then, one day, the witch decides she's waited long enough and she prepares the oven to plan to bake Hansel. Fortunately, Gretel outsmarts the witch before she can cook her brother by pushing her into the oven instead. The children then search her house where they find gold, jewelry, and other valuables before leaving. Scared and back in the same situation as before, they wander the woods. The birds decide to help the children by leading them back to their father's home. The woodcutter was shocked, but happy to see his children were alive. He was very regretful of his decision. The stepmother died while they were away. With the valuables in tow, he and his children lived happily ever after. There are a couple of possible origin stories for Hansel and Gretel. The first goes back to a cohort of tales that originated in the Baltic regions during the Great Famine of 1314 to 1322. Volcanic activity in Southeast Asia and New Zealand pushed in a period of prolonged climate change that led to crop failures and massive starvation across the globe. In Europe, the situation was dire since the food supply was already scarce. When the Great Famine struck, results were devastating, impacting 400,000 square miles of Europe, with an estimated 25% of the population of certain areas being killed off. It was so bad the elderly opted to starve to death to allow the young to live. Others committed infanticide or just abandoned their children. Women ate their own children and people even exhumed the recently deceased to eat as well just so they wouldn't starve to death. And from this series of sad events, a children's fairy tale was born. Hi my friends, glad to see you made it this far. I love history and I'm always so fascinated when the media we enjoy has real stories behind it. I know everything gets some kind of inspiration from somewhere, but a lot of these seem to have very true crime and odd elements that I felt were fitting for our channel. I enjoyed making this one a lot and I hope you enjoyed listening. Let me know what you think in the comments and we can chat about it. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. I appreciate your love and support from each and every one of you. As always, you are all the best. I hope you have a great week ahead of you, but for now, stay safe out there and I will see you in the next one. Bye friends.